Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's great to see a capacity crowd joining us for character and the presidency, and specifically character and the presidency of Gerald R. Ford. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I'm your host this evening, and I'm proud to serve as the director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. Well, there are a lot of folks in this room who helped make this evening possible. And I and my colleagues would like to express a debt of gratitude to Peter Secchia, Joan Secchia, and the Secchia family for their generous support and especially their vision for this series and for this conference today. Uh, more about Peter. There's going to be more about Peter. We're not finished with you yet in about an hour. And then also thanks to Hank Meyer and the Meyer Foundation also for vision and support for this program. We couldn't do it without you, Hank. Thanks so much. <laughs> then Elaine Didier and her staff over at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum have been helpful. Joe Calvaruzzo, Donna, and their staff over at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation have been so helpful. We couldn't put on programs without their help of this, programs of this caliber. Uh, also, I want to mention Ralph Howenstein. You know, Ralph continues to uh, be a great support to us. He has so many friends and people who've been generous in their gifts to the Howenstein Center and to Grand Valley. We thank them for making it possible. And I'm not sure where they are in the audience, but two of the Howensteins, uh, Ralph D. and Carolyn, are here representing uh, their dad. So thank you very much for being here. And then there are several additional individuals I'd like to mention just very briefly. We're so pleased to have Michigan uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice Bob Young with us this after this evening and also Grand Rapids School Superintendent Teresa Weatherall. Neil, thank you so much for being here. And Grand Valley President Tom Haas and Marsha Haas, First Lady. Thanks so much. Let's give them a hand. Well, I see Marty Allen in the audience, and he was chairman emeritus of the Ford Foundation, a good friend of the 38th president, and uh, I always think of a story that Marty told me uh, the time of the, the military aide who was in charge of the funeral arrangements for President Ford, came to see the president, and he came up to Ford and he said, you know, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is that about 500,000 people want to see you. So President Ford is going, well, what could possibly be the bad news? The bad news is that it's going to be at your funeral. <laughs> but you know, tonight, tonight, you are testimony that people still want to know about President Ford and his remarkable life, his leadership and service to this nation. So I think we ought to give you a hand for being here to learn about the president. Thank you, Peter. We have a full evening planned to plumb our theme on character. We have a keynoter by Richard Norton Smith. We have remarks by Peter Secchia. We have two brief, rough cut clips from a documentary that's being produced about President Ford. We have a panel discussion about the centrality of character in the Oval Office. It's also going to be very enlightening. And finally, a book signing by Richard just on the wall opposite, outside in the uh, lobby. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, dessert and more conversation with our speakers. So we're just delighted that you're here to participate in all of that. Now, for the introduction of this evening's keynoter. We are most fortunate here at Grand Valley to have Richard Norton Smith, a distinguished biographer and presidential historian, as our colleague on this campus. And you may recall that Richard served with distinction at the uh, Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum here in town. He's certainly no stranger to many of you in this audience. That was a few years back, and he's currently serving in a presidential appointment here at Grand Valley and is writing what will surely be the definitive and certainly the authoritative biography of the 38th president. Here in town, you may have run into Richard. There have been reports of Richard sightings around town, especially if you go over by the tomb just a few blocks from here. And if you've not seen him there, Perhaps you have seen him on C-SPAN or the PBS NewsHour where he offers commentary that I say is deeper and wiser than that offered by the excellent sheep who typically populate our TV screens. <laughs> Richard once uh, said that the Howenstein Center is the jewel in the crown of Michigan. Uh, 
high praise that, and I'd like to return the compliment, Richard. Richard's biographies, whether they are about George Washington or Colonel McCormick, whether they're about uh, Herbert Hoover or Nelson Rockefeller, those biographies are also a jewel in the crown in the Republic of Letters. He knows how to write engaging, informed biographies that really get to the heart of the person. And so we're always very pleased when we can hear Richard. He always rewards our attention with his words. Please welcome Richard Norton Smith. Thank you, Cleves, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, and let me reciprocate. It's, uh, um, I think, a remarkable thing that Gleaves and his colleagues have accomplished and continue to accomplish uh, within the uh, larger miracle of this university, which has, uh, any way you look at it, obviously in terms of numbers, but more important in terms of quality, uh, established itself as a, a place that uh, not only the rest of Michigan, but arguably the rest of the country could learn from. So congratulations. Um, I'm here as a Peter's warm-up act, which is uh, an unusual uh, but very honorary position to be in. Um, I have the, frankly, impossible task of trying to address, first of all, this vast subject of presidential character, uh, and then zero in uh, on, on Gerald Ford. And I, I must warn you up front, I'm about a year and a half into my research. I spent 14 years on the Rockefeller. Um, I have no intention of spending 14 years on, on this, but uh, I, I obviously have established uh, uh, the right to change my mind. So anyway, two months from now, Iowans will assemble in a thousand town halls and church basements to begin the process of reclaiming our democracy from the pyroclastic flow of cable TV pundits, bookmaking journalists, and too many pollsters to count. No doubt some of them will be guided by ideology as they make their choice. Others will stress electability. And still others will raise the character issue, a standard on which everyone, it seems, can agree, even if no two among us can agree precisely on what it means. For example, historically speaking, should Lyndon Johnson be remembered as a Texan vulgarian or as a, a statesman who had the courage and the vision and the commitment um, to sacrifice the support of the then solid South um, as the inevitable price for passing long overdue civil rights and voting rights legislation? Well, the obvious answer is he is both. But that is complicated. I often say the two worst words in English language are either or. Uh, they tend to be the most predominant on cable TV. But um, try to get them out of your head for the rest of the evening at least. If it's any consolation, we've been citing and debating presidential character for as long as we've been choosing presidents. Cast your mind back two centuries to the bitterly contested election of 1800, in which President John Adams was challenged for re-election by his vice president, Thomas Jefferson. Were his countrymen so misguided as to award the presidency to the free-thinking, French-speaking, macaroni-serving infidel of Monticello, declared one Connecticut journal, quote, unrestrained by law, or the fear of punishment, neighbors will become enemies of neighbors, brothers of brothers, fathers of their sons, and sons of their fathers. Murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of distress, the soil soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes. As objective political analysis, this is on a par with today's shrillest character assassinations on talk radio or the blogosphere. It led Jefferson himself, that great friend of free expression, to declare the most trustworthy part of the daily newspaper to be the advertisements. 
The original strict constructionist is President Jefferson ran the federal government on $7 million a year. He applied twice that sum toward liquidating the national debt. For Jefferson, of all men, the best government was the least government. And then the vast territory known as Louisiana came on the market. Overnight, Jefferson's principles came into conflict with his vision of a continental republic, what he called, not without irony, an empire of liberty. In 1803, Jeffersonian restraint gave way before the ultimate real estate deal. With the proverbial stroke of the pen, the new republic was doubled in size at three cents an acre. I stretched the Constitution so far that it cracked, Jefferson acknowledged, an act for which two centuries later he is gratefully remembered, especially west of the Mississippi. To cast off one's defining principles would not, in most situations, be taken as proof of sterling character. And yet history suggests to us that such flexibility may be the essence of statecraft if it means putting the national interest ahead of short-term political advantage or even political consistency. Think of FDR's guileful, occasionally duplicitous, but always skillful maneuverings of an isolationist nation toward robust support of Churchill's Britain. Think of Richard Nixon's U-turn leading the veteran anti-communist to swap epigrams with Mao Zedong. Think of George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988 announcing, read my lips, and two years later asking us to unread his lips as part of the 1990 budget deal. Or think of Gerald Ford in his vice presidential hearings saying, in his opinion, people would not stand for the pardoning of Richard Nixon. A year later, he's put his theory to the test with politically disastrous results. So what is character? Character, said Abraham Lincoln, is like a tree and reputation like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. Nearly a decade after his passing, Gerald Ford, it's safe to say, still cast a long shadow over this place in which his character was forged, and an even longer one over a political process sorely lacking in his characteristic civility and moderation. My assignment this evening, as I said, and it's a daunting one, is to begin to trace the origins of that character and its implications for the Ford presidency and beyond. As with anyone in this room, one might cite a laundry list of influences, including but by no means limited to community and home environment, extended family, teachers, coaches, and mentors, friends and girlfriends, teammates and troop masters, DNA and spiritual training, and plain old-fashioned luck. In fact, Gerald Ford considered himself the most fortunate of men, not because of any office he held, but because of the mother and stepfather who led by example and loved unconditionally. Of all the entries lovingly inscribed in the baby book of Leslie King Jr., chronicling every milestone from first spoken words, bye-bye, uttered at 10 months, to first game of patty cake, none are more poignant than the page headed Baby's Outings. Here, registered without comment, is Baby's first automobile ride across the Mississippi River to Council Bluffs, Iowa, from which a train carried him and his mother safely to his maternal aunt's home in the Chicago suburbs. The date was July 30th, 1913, two days after the baby's father had appeared menacingly, carving knife in hand, in the room occupied by his wife and their two-week-old son. Dorothy Gardner King, fearing for both their wives, had snatched up her infant and put Omaha behind her. Before the year was out, her marriage to Leslie King was formally dissolved. Custody of young Junior King, or Junie as he came to be known, was awarded to his mother 
along with child support payments that her faithless former husband would evade for 20 years. Under the circumstances, Dorothy no doubt welcomed an appeal to join her parents in their modest bungalow at 1960 Terrace, later Prospect Street in Grand Rapids. Here, Junior King attempted his first uncertain steps, perhaps in frustration over his rate of progress. One day, he tossed his grandfather's shoes and socks into the toilet. <laughs> if I inherited anything, Gerald Ford Jr. said of his birth father, I inherited his temper. This, he admitted, was terrible. His playmates would have agreed. A very headstrong little boy, recalled one still marveling after half a century at the stubborn belligerence with which Junie single-handedly prevented a group of older children from scaling a backyard cherry tree. My tree, he declared. And when a girl twice his age made the attempt, quote, he stood on her hand until she screamed. Then he took his foot off. In his memoirs, Ford described the shaming tactics employed by his mother, who reminded him in front of a mirror how foolish he looked when red-faced with anger. When ridicule fell short, religion was invoked, with Dorothy invoking the same passage from Proverbs that Ida Eisenhower in Abilene, Kansas, employed to address anger management issues with her son, Dwight. While Ford may well have drawn inspiration from scripture, privately, he attributed his hard-won self-control to a rather more conventional approach taken by Dorothy Ford. In his words, she gave me unshirted hell every time I would blow up. Other factors came into play. The character-building virtues of Eagle Scouting taught him self-restraint as well as self-reliance. Competitive athletics helped to channel his aggressive feelings. As an adult, he was notably more restrained. Like other executives from Oliver Cromwell to Ike, Ford learned to govern himself before he governed others. He was a big bear, says one intimate, 98% teddy bear and 2% grizzly. <laughs> Accounts by White House insiders invariably portray Ford as the calmest man in the room. Few guessed at the effort required to maintain such equanimity. Few were still chance to observe the dark red shading that sometimes crept above the presidential shirt collar, evidence of anger unexpressed. Though her divorce precluded Dorothy King from becoming a member of St. Mark's Episcopal Church, it didn't prevent her from being a regular attendant. It was at a church social in 1915 that she first met Gerald Ford Sr. To Dorothy, a newcomer to Grand Rapids wearing the scarlet letter of divorce, Gerald Ford represented all that was lacking in her first husband. Responsible, mature, and above all, stable. He shared her faith and upheld her values. A family man in the making, Ford reached out to Dorothy's infant son, with whom he established an emotional bond second only to the marriage officialized in February 1917. The older Ford encouraged Junior in his athletic pursuits, teaching him to swim at the local YMCA and inviting him on fishing expeditions at his northern Michigan cabin. Yet even as the growing family enjoyed the fruits of Mr. Ford's success, they could never entirely escape Dorothy's past. Though out of sight, Leslie King made certain that he was not out of mind. In February 1921, he rejected Dorothy's request for an increase in monthly child support. Quote, with my present salary, the remarried King told his lawyer, and with a family to care for, he was in no position to do more. He didn't stop there. Quote, I have been thinking of getting permission from the court to have the boy half the time, King wrote with casual cruelty, since he has grown up to realize that he has a father. Here is the first surprise of the evening. Everyone knows the story, the famous story, about how President Ford met his birth father for the first time working at a hamburger joint across the street from school. What no one has ever been able to determine and to the best of my determining, because he never said, when and how did he find out that he wasn't 
Jerry Ford's son. This suggested he knew when he was eight and a half. One might pass off the incident as more of Wesley's bravado, except for its coincidence with the worst of Junie's childish tantrums, compounded by a severe case of stuttering that would plague the boy for several years. Both parents took an active part in shaping their children's education, supplementing the usual classroom disciplines with churchy, a weekly church attendance and the character molding of competitive athletics. When they were young, Dorothy read to the boys from the Oz books and other volumes targeted at childish imaginations. Reflecting his family's hard scrabble existence, Junie devoured the Horatio Alger stories in which poor boys defied the odds to achieve great and tangible rewards. Savored under the bed covers long after the rest of the household had retired for the night, titles like Strive and Succeed and Jed, the poorhouse boy, formed an important chapter in his self-education. These and other dime store novels distilled a formula for success neatly summarized in the adult Ford's credo the harder you work, the luckier you are. Junie's life on Union Street featured plentiful opportunities for testing this theory. There was no shortage of chores to do or outside jobs to take on. The family's finances were always precarious. And by my calculation, Junior King slash Ford, and by the way, he was addressed as Junior for at least the first 10 or 11 years of his life he might be forgiven for questioning exactly who he was. Was he Junior King or Junior Ford? One of the remarkable things I found when he uh, uh, earned his, the badge, the, the Eagle Scout badge, uh, his mother wrote on the back of it, J.K. Ford. Spontaneous and empathetic, Dorothy Ford set an example of broad-mindedness, implanting the generosity of spirit, some critics called it naivete, that would find ultimate expression in her son's pardon of his White House predecessor. I always felt a person had some good quality in him or her, said the adult Ford, and so I never really ended up hating anybody. The ultimate source of this outlook rare among professional politicians, is not hard to trace. The Fords were regular churchgoers, praying to a loving God whose intervention in human affairs did not end on a Jerusalem hillside 2,000 years ago. Gerald Ford's reluctance as president to advertise his faith was contrasted with Jimmy Carter's overt appeals to his spiritual brethren. Yet though Ford never taught a Sunday school class, his wife did. In fact, Gerald and Betty Ford were a biblically grounded couple. Their first response to news of Richard Nixon's pending resignation was famously to hold hands and repeat the verse Jerry had learned as a troubled youngster, uncertain of his parentage. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In this, they reflected the values imparted by both Dorothy and Jerry Sr. That his mother was the chief source of Ford's drive and unflagging energy seems likewise beyond dispute. One measure of her impact can be found in a remark made by her firstborn son not long before he died. A visiting nephew asked Uncle Jerry if he had a formula to explain his success in politics. The older statesman pondered this for a few moments before telling Greg Ford, quote, I made everyone else's problems my problems. The phrase struck, struck me and stuck with me, and I knew there was something to which it was connected. Sure enough, 30 years earlier, in his memoir, he had said the exact same thing in describing his mother whom he called the most selfless person I have ever known. Discipline was sure to be an issue under any roof sheltering four boys. Elbows on the dinner table were met by a sharp rap 
with a spoon. Punctuality was expected, profanity strictly forbidden. <clears throat> I whipped off at a substitute teacher one time, says Tom Ford, an action resulting in his eviction from class, with the understanding he would not be readmitted until he brought his parents with him to see the principal. The next morning, Mr. Ford duly appeared in the school's front office. Stan, he said, I don't even want to hear it. As for the offending youngster, quote, he's going to come home and tell me what you did to punish him, and he's going to get twice that at home. With that, Mr. Ford turned around and walked out the door. He fully honored his promise to the principal. On another occasion, he broke a ruler over Tom's backside when the boy offered a West incredible tale to justify being late for dinner. This had less to do with Tom's tardiness than his willingness to bend the truth in hopes of escaping punishment. To his father, says Dick Ford, quote, character and integrity were the most important things in the whole world. If you did something wrong and it came to light, if you didn't lie about it, there was no problem. Cuny did not escape parental Correction. When he backed up the family's six passenger Chandler sedan one night, losing a spare tire in the process, the cost of its replacement came out of his pocket, a memory that still rankled 50 years later. As an eagle eyed guardian of the public treasury, Congressman Ford was noted for his practice of wearing pencils down to a stubble and turning out the lights in his Capitol Hill office and adjoining corridors to save on electric bills. I was brought up to pay your bills, Gerald Ford said of the man he considered the single most important influence in his life. Millions of Depression era kids could say much the same. So hard pressed was Gary Sr. during his son's college years that he once bartered paint in exchange for a knee operation the boy required to play football. At the trough of the Depression, Mr. Ford barely hung on to his paint and varnish business by paying himself $5 a week, the same amount he paid his small workforce in a, in a successful effort to keep them from joining the swelling unemployment lines. Through it all, the Fords studiously avoided government assistance. We never were on welfare, an elderly former president asserted. Somehow, we always got by. That said, Gerald Ford Sr. never displayed the self-satisfaction of some who donned the mantle of self-made man. The elder Ford was a co-founder of Youth Commonwealth, an early attempt to assist city boys here in Grand Rapids, many of them African-American who were living in economically deprived neighborhoods. There was always politics in the house, claims one family member, and yet Gerald Sr. counted among his friends as many Democrats as Republicans. The lesson would not be lost on his son any more than his stepfather's uncanny ability to establish seemingly instant rapport with potential customers. He went in with a true salesman's philosophy, says his son Dick, how can I help you? The same skill set would serve Congressman Ford well on the campaign trail, in the party caucus, and constituent office. It was to prove invaluable in the White House, where he invited butlers to join him in watching Saturday afternoon football games, and where he once reduced a Georgetown Taylor summoned to the White House for some last minute alterations to a presidential garment to tears. It seems the man happened to be a Holocaust survivor. He described his life for the president. He was unprepared to hear the president of the United States describe him and his fellow survivors as the very best of American citizens. For as long as he lived, <clears throat> Ford would periodically ask himself how his stepfather might handle a situation. <clears throat> Certainly in the most important decision of his life, and against all odds, he emulated his stepfather's action in marrying a divorced woman, though making sure to schedule 
the ceremony after the Republican primary for Congress. <coughs> Finally, there were less tangible qualities the future president imbibed from growing up around Dorothy and Gerald Ford Sr. Jerry is not demonstrative, uh, according to his sister-in-law, Janet. In this, as in so much else, <coughs> excuse me, he took after his parents. They were not touching people, which only made Gerald Ford's public reaction on the final morning of his uphill 1976 campaign to win the presidency in his own right all the more affecting. Even as his countrymen began streaming to the polls to render a verdict on his two years in office, Grand Rapids friends and admirers crowded into the local airport for the unveiling of a mural depicting key moments in Ford's life. Some of you may very well have been there. Ford saluted the artist for his talent, thanked his neighbors for their generosity, but it was the portrayal of his parents, neither of whom had lived to share the moment that brought the President of the United States to tears. Whatever he might have accomplished, he told a clearly moved audience, was due to quote the training, the love, the leadership of Gerald and Dorothy Ford. He praised, he paused, overcome by emotion, and what Edith Wharton called the poignancy of vanished things. Which brings us back to the tree and its shadow. Imagine the year's 1930. <clears throat> the Ford family is preparing to trade the Union Street home they have occupied for seven years for a fixer-upper in the more upscale East Grand Rapids neighborhood. For young Jerry, newly elected captain of the South High football team, the news is decidedly mixed. For he has no desire to leave his teammates at South. So he makes arrangements to complete his senior year studies there. That is not all, however. One evening, seemingly out of the blue, he calls up Reed Waterman, head coach at East Grand Rapids High. He explains to Coach Waterman that much as he admires him personally, his program, and personnel, he has his heart set on graduating with his current teammates. He reiterates, he wants Coach Waterman to know this is no reflection on him or his school. Waterman, not surprisingly, would never forget the call or the caller. Now fast forward 35 years to the spring of 1965. In the wake of the Goldwater debacle a few months earlier, Republicans have elected Jerry Ford to lead their greatly reduced numbers in the House of Representatives. Among the tsunami of Democratic first-termers is a young Hoosier named Lee Hamilton. Hamilton has no reason to expect favors from Ford. Besides their party differences, Indiana is home to Charlie Halleck, a long-serving minority leader just opposed by Ford in a bitterly fought contest decided in the end by the Kansas delegation led by 41-year-old Bob Dole. But Hamilton was in for a surprise. New to the House and its sometimes arcane procedures, he made an a parliamentary error in introducing a bill, one he didn't even know about, until a fellow Hoosier, a Republican no less, dispatched by Republican leader Ford, tipped him off to his mistake and showed him how to correct it. Like Coach Waterman before him, Congressman Hamilton would long remember Ford's kindness. Finally, imagine yourselves in the White House usher's office on a Sunday morning early in 1976. It is the first day in charge there for newly hired assistant usher Gary Walters, a former Secret Service agent who is more than a bit rattled to take a phone call from the president, casually informing Walters that there is no hot water in the presidential shower. It being Sunday, the White House plumber is nowhere on the premises. Not to worry, said Walters, there was no shortage of engineers. Knowing that the Fords would soon be going to church, he promised to have the problem fixed by the time they returned from the services. <clears throat> 
No need to rush, said President Ford. I haven't had any hot water for two weeks. <laughs> Can you imagine Lyndon Johnson? <laughs> Before an astonished Walters can mutter a sufficiently abject apology, the president reassures him, it's no big deal. I've just been using Mrs. Ford's shower. He needn't disturb anyone. If it can be fixed Monday morning, that will be just fine. OK, think of those three stories. That's the Jerry Ford we all know. That's the shadow. That's the reputation. Is it the tree? Maybe it is. But it also raises, it seems to me, a legitimate question that could be applied to almost no other American president. And you may laugh, but it's a serious question. Can a man be too nice to be president? I ask because there is some evidence to suggest that he can. Don Rumsfeld, whatever you think of him, was absolutely correct in advising the president very early on that forced to choose between change and continuity, change for a domestic audience, continuity for the global audience, that he should pick change, that he should clean out the Nixon White House as quickly as possible, that he should do it as publicly as possible, um, and that he should get the political credit for doing so and for putting his own stamp on the White House as soon as he could. Ford didn't do that. And he didn't do it for reasons that testify to his character in many ways. One, he thought it was unfair to the vast majority of Nixon White House employees who had nothing to do with Watergate. He thought it was unfair to the vast majority of Nixon employees who we tend to forget, but who were then and are now uh, held in very high regard in terms of sheer competence and ability. And third, he didn't do it because uh, he was practical minded and he understood that if you cleaned out the White House overnight, how quickly were you gonna get it filled up again with uh, your people, uh, people who could run the government. Um, I mean, he had a number of obligations, um, but he was not going to throw overboard everyone tarred, if you will, with the Nixon Association. He paid a price for that. And I think probably in retrospect, he, well, he, I don't know, but he, he, he would have been better served, there's no doubt about it, historically, had he taken Rumsfeld's advice. It was no accident that one of his earliest acts as president was to replace the cabinet room portrait of Woodrow Wilson that Nixon hung there with the likeness of Harry Truman, another plain spoken Midwesterner who reached the presidency by historical accident. Few presidents have seemed more comfortable in their skin or less scripted in their comments. Witness Truman's classic observation, I wonder how far Moses would have gotten if he'd taken a poll in Egypt. <clears throat> <laughs> Gerald Ford shared Truman's candor, though not always it must be said to his advantage. We all remember his debate with Jimmy Carter in which he prematurely liberated communist Poland. But there was also his brutally frank and calculated admission at the beginning of his 1975 State of the Union address that the State of the Union was not good. If you notice, in 40 years since, no other president has gone anywhere near that line. We admire such honesty, but we don't always reward it at the polls. Um, not long ago, I was uh, at an event in New York on the Rockefeller book, and I was sitting at dinner next to Governor Thomas Kane of New Jersey, um, the predecessor to Christy Todd Whitman, and a wonderful guy. And, um, as they, he told me the story, he loved Gerald Ford. He went on, how much he loved Gerald Ford. Um, and then he went on to tell the story. There was a very young man in New Jersey. He was an advanced man on the 1976 campaign. And the president was coming in in New Jersey, which, by the way, he carried. And uh, he was going to Atlantic City. So uh, Tom Kane was 
um, uh, briefing him on the local political landscape and above all warning him there was a referendum about gambling. This was in fact before Atlantic City had turned into Atlantic City and it was all, this was the beginnings of it really. And uh, anyway, so he's going on and on about all the reasons why, just avoid it, avoid it like plague, you won't get any votes. Atlantic City is, you know, very widely democratic anyway. Um, but, you know, it's just, he says, okay, okay. He goes to Atlantic City, he can't help himself. Someone, some reporter asks him, Mr. President, what do you think about gambling? You know, with this on the ballot. He said, well, I'll tell you. I always believe Michigan gambling was a pretty bad idea, so I'd vote against it if I were here. Well, he didn't carry Atlantic City, but he did carry New Jersey, surprisingly. The only thing worse than lying to people is lying to yourself, and that goes double for a president. And that was one thing Gerald Ford would never let happen. Remember in the spring of 1975, when Vietnam was about to fall, and he wanted to send someone over there um, with the eyes and ears and expertise to give him an honest, uh, with the bark off report. And so he turned, first of all, to his army chief of staff, a man named Frederick Wyland, uh, just passed away, by the way. Um, and then, being Gerald Ford, he thought, you know, he wanted insurance. He wanted someone who he could be absolutely certain would tell him whatever he saw and would not sugarcoat. So he turned to David Kennerly, the White House photographer, who was really in many ways a member of the Ford family. And um, he went off to Southeast Asia along with General Wyland. And they came back, and let's just say their reports didn't exactly converge. But um, in any event, Kennerly came back famously and said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is the Vietnam War is over. The bad news is we lost. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't funny then, but it was blunt and honest, and it needed to be heard. And Ford listened to David Kennelly. He listened to General Wyland. He listened to a lot of people. But he realized at that point there was nothing to be served by beating up on Congress for, for not appropriating another $700 million that um, his historical assignment, as in so many other cases, think of cleaning up after Richard Nixon, think of cleaning up the CIA, think of cleaning up the mess in Southeast Asia. Um, his job was to try to make the best of a bad situation and to find as much honor as possible. And then, of course, there were the refugees. I think his finest hour is president. And my god, I don't want to get political, but anyone who says history doesn't repeat itself, I think we're up to 32 governors who have rushed to the cameras today to uh, announce that they're not going to allow any Syrian refugees in, uh, on their soil. Well, the ghost of Gerald Ford is not smiling. Right after Saigon fell, understandably, understandably, America and particularly her politicians wanted to try to forget the whole nightmare. They wanted to pull the plug and tell themselves we, we were never really there. Let's start over. Perfectly understandable. But their president wouldn't let them. He had this uncomfortable thing called a conscience. And with it, he had a sense of history. And his history of the United States told him that we had a particular, indeed, a special role. If you're going to talk about American exceptionalism, you're going to talk about America as an asylum for the world's oppressed, for the world's victims, for people who are persecuted on behalf of any number of reasons. And he put together this crazy quilt coalition, probably could never happen today, and he went to the country, and he shamed Congress, which I know couldn't happen today. <laughs> and in the end, brought out 120, for the beginning, brought out about 120,000 
uh, as, a, as in effect a first wave, many of whom settled here in West Michigan, many of whom were here that extraordinary day over a decade ago when he came back from Rancho Mirage to dedicate that staircase from the top of the U.S. Embassy. Um, it was, um, I had lots of wonderful days here. I don't think I'll ever have a day to, to match that. And, and because it was in recognition of what he had done against great odds, uh, demonstrating what presidential character is capable of achieving. Anyway, that is sort of the Jerry Ford we all think we know. Good old Jerry to his colleagues on the Hill. How many times have you heard, what you see is what you get? An ordinary man called by extraordinary events. What if he wasn't ordinary? There was nothing ordinary about Gerald Ford's childhood. Quite the contrary. From the age of about 15, he was a celebrity on the football field, first locally, and then statewide, and then nationally. People forget uh, the East-West Shrine game and the All-Star game in 1935. The latter one, at least, those players had to be voted on, like the All-Stars today in today's baseball. There were X number of people all over America who knew the name of the Michigan Center. There was nothing ordinary about Gerald Ford's life. Let me tell you a few bits and pieces of surprising news that I found along the way that I think are anything other than ordinary. As I said earlier, everyone, everyone knows the story, the, the, the traumatic story, the melodramatic story of Gerald Ford's encounter with his birth father who gave him $20 and disappeared. What they don't know is the next day what he did with the $20. He spent $13 on a pair of golf knickers. Because it was almost important to look good. <laughs> Clothes mattered. Golf mattered. In any event, he may have been traumatized, but at least he was well dressed. In 1930, his political career began. He was 17 years old. He stood on a street corner in Grand Rapids handing out literature for Mayor John D. Carroll. It was a lot earlier than we thought his interest in politics started. It was a year ahead of May Day in 1931 when he personally led a group of football players at South High, enforcing a small group of communist classmates to erase the May Day slogans they had chalked into the school steps. In 1948, of course, he ran as an internationalist, a young returning veteran against um, a veteran congressman um, who thought the world ended somewhere around Terre Haute. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that campaign was less about world affairs than we've thought. One of the significant factors in contributing to Ford's victory was a young union organizer named Leonard Woodcock who, by the way, years later would serve on the Vietnam amnesty panel that the president selected. Gerald Ford went to Congress as an internationalist. In his first year, the man we all think of as Mr. Conservative, good old Jerry, was one of 81 congressmen, the only one in Michigan, who signed a petition for world government, world federalism. He got over that real soon. In 1967, the Republican leader of the House, who wanted very much to build a Republican party in the South, but not, not, I emphasize, a Republican party that would have any truck with segregation. He was uh, spending, as we all know, 200 nights a year on the road. And he was in the South speaking at a number of uh, dinners, except one in Mississippi that he canceled very publicly. You could hardly cover it up. And he canceled it because it was limited to whites only. 
We all think of him and Ev Dirksen as the Ev and Jerry show, two classic performers, the straight man from Michigan, uh, the Wizard of Ooze from uh, Peoria. <laughs> the fact of the matter is they were perfectly friendly, but they were not often in agreement. Gerald Ford thought that Everett Dirksen was much too accommodating of Lyndon Johnson, particularly on the Vietnam War. And even it was a classic generational divide. As president, he found himself called upon to replace William O. Douglas, with whom he had a somewhat checkered relationship in the past. And by the way, he publicly acknowledged his regret over the, his part in the effort to impeach Justice Douglas. When uh, the news came through of Justice Douglas's letter that retiring, someone who was in the room told me the story. Ford said out loud, he said, you know who would make a great Chief Justice? No, you know who would make a great Supreme Court Justice? Of course, I would say, who? He said, Barbara Jordan. Didn't go any further, but it's a remarkable, surprising window on how his mind, in fact, operated. And finally, we all know the story about the almost vice presidency with Ronald Reagan, which over the years has been told in a number of ways, but always to suggest that President Ford made unrealistic demands. In fact, he never used the phrase co-presidency. Walter Cronkite did, but that's okay. In fact, when he got on the plane at the end of the week, he turned to his aide and said, well, Robert, not a bad convention. I gave a good speech, and I got Bush as vice president. The aide said, were you conning them? He changed the subject. <clears throat> Was he too nice to be president? Well, Ask Nelson Rockefeller, who we dumped out of political necessity in the fall of 1975. There's a wonderful story that goes to the heart, I think, of who Gerald Ford really was. <clears throat> a month before he became president, he'd been a very unhappy vice president. One reason why he let Rockefeller have such leeway for example, how he ruled over the Senate, uh, and a number of other things, more than any vice president in recent times. But the fact is, um, he'd been vice president, and he hated it. He said it was the worst job he ever had. And he was sympathetic to Nelson, who he knew was, was hating it even more than he was. So remember, put that into context. One month before Vice President Ford becomes President Ford, July 9th, 1974, Benton Becker, aide who we recently lost, sadly, and who was pivotal in the whole negotiations around the pardon, Benton told me this story. He was a great admirer of Earl Warren. Earl Warren died that day. And he said, you know, Mr. Vice President, it would be very nights if you could go up to the Supreme Court where Chief Justice Warren was lying in state and pay your respects. And of course, Ford and Warren had both been on the Warren, Com Warren Commission. So they had a relationship. It was a prickly relationship, quite frankly. And politically, it was distant. Nevertheless, Ford thought, pondered this. He said, you know, I don't think Nixon would be very happy because Nixon hated Warren, um, a feeling that was mutually returned. <clears throat> um, so anyway, Benton Becker figures, well, listen, I'm, you know, we move on to other things, and they did. Later in the day, he discovered to his mild astonishment, on his own, without telling anyone in advance, the vice president of the United States had decided, you know, it was the decent thing to go up to the Supreme Court and place a wreath in front of Chief Justice Warren's casket. <clears throat> 
And sure enough, <laughs> he told Benton Becker, Nixon really didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> Was he too nice to be president? Well, he uh, issued 66 vetoes. You might ask Congress if he was too nice. You might ask the people of New York, who were quite frankly saved by the tough love approach that he took. Governor Hugh Carey told me years later, Ford's never got the credit, but the fact of the matter is, if it had not been for his tough love approach to New York City, the city would have never survived the fiscal crisis or begun to practice some fiscal discipline. Helsinki, the Helsinki Accords today are seen universally as a milestone on the road to the end of the Cold War. At the time, Gerald Ford was under enormous attack from left and right. Jimmy Carter ran against him and Ronald Reagan ran against him. He was tough enough, or if you want to say, not nice enough to stick to his convictions. Picking John Paul Stevens to replace Justice Douglas. Again, he was under pressure from the right of his own party and from the left to pick another Douglas. Instead, he did it right down the middle. He did it a model way, probably, whatever you think of the outcome, probably the closest thing to an ideal, non-political, non-partisan, thoughtful, intellectual, uh, approach to picking a United States Supreme Court justice. And I would argue that history um, uh, has rewarded both men. Was he too nice? Well, he fired Jim Schlesinger. Not only did he fire Jim Schlesinger, Dick Cheney told us a story about one day Schlesinger was Secretary of Defense and he and Ford had never, the chemistry had never been right. Ford could get along with anyone, anyone. But he couldn't get along with Jim Schlesinger, who was an academic and had a condescending attitude. And Ford said one day, he said, he thinks I'm stupid. He thinks I'm a dummy. Even that he was prepared to put up with to a certain point. But when Schlesinger did not carry out presidential directives, that was a firing offense. Cheney said, you want me to do it, Mr. President, knowing how much Ford, he said, nah, I can't wait to fire the son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> One last story, and then we'll, we'll break. Because it really goes, again, to the heart of who this man was, what kind of leader he wanted to be, what kind of president he wanted to be, what kind of president he had grown into. You must remember, Gerald Ford, when he became president, every president has on-the-job training. You, you'll see the ads every four years, this is someone who doesn't need job. Well, forget it, everyone is, uh, is trained on the job. Because the fact of the matter is, history pays vastly less attention to what a president, the great agenda he outlines in his inaugural address than to how a president reacts to the phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, to the unexpected, to the unpredictable. That's when a president earns his historical stripes and his figurative place on Mount Rushmore. Gerald Ford took office with no preparation to speak of. And he spent the next two and a half years, day by day, learning to be president. But he never outgrew whatever it was that he brought with him from this place that insisted on seeing the decency in other people, even if it was obscure to everyone else. Classic example. The spring of 1976, he is fighting for his life against Ronald Reagan in the Republican primary. And, um, Jim Baker, who is just beginning to make a name for himself, he's an assistant secretary of commerce, but in fact, he's already beginning to impress people with his political skills, and he's on his way to becoming, for example, the chief delegate hunter for the Ford campaign, and obviously much more ahead. Baker is shrewd enough to realize that the Ford White House is perhaps barking up 
the wrong tree in their pursuit of black rule for uh, black majority rule for Africa, for Southern Africa, and particularly for Rhodesia, what we call today Zimbabwe. And Henry Kissinger was being sent by the president at the very eve of the Texas primary to go to sub-Sahara Africa to meet with a number of, of leaders, African leaders, in a very obvious attempt, peacefully, to bring about a transition from white majority, white minority rule to, in effect, democracy, black majority rule throughout the continent of Africa, with obviously South Africa and apartheid next. Um, Jim Baker thinks this is very admirable as policy, but highly questionable as politics. And he's going on about it. And someone says, well, why don't you make an appointment to see the president? He'll see you, you know. He said, you think so? He said, sure. So anyway, they make an appointment. He goes to the Oval Office. He goes in, finds the president at his desk, pipe in his hand, smoking, um, genial. Uh, what's on your mind, Jim? Baker begins to outline all of this. Ford nods his head, wreathed in smoke, um, taking it all in. And when he finishes, Ford said, well, I really appreciate, Jim, what you have to say. Makes a lot of sense. But I'm sure that people of goodwill will accept this policy. And there's a pause. And Jim Baker says, Mr. President, you don't understand. In Texas, there are no people of goodwill. <laughs> well, history has been kinder. He lost the Texas primary, 100 delegates to none. But he won the nomination, and the rest is history. Thank you very much. Except for that Texas comment, I thought those remarks were great. <laughs> no, thank you, Richard, very much for a, a wonderful, terrific talk. And I can't, this is just a foretaste of the feast to come in the biography, and hopefully we won't wait 14 years for that. So we're looking very forward to that.